Let's go to our uh, next guest on the program, Liberal Senator James Patterson in our Melbourne studios. Senator, thanks very much for your time as ever. Uh, now, Hello, the front Tom. page of The Australian today, the Greens are calling on a climate deal with Labor. Now, in the event of an election loss for you, if you, the Coalition wants to avoid this happening, you could have a compromise of sorts uh, with Labor. Would you consider that? Tom, we've seen this movie before and we know how it ends, just like it did under the minority Gillard government. Um, this election is looking like it's going to be much closer and much more competitive than the Labor Party uh, had assumed it was going to be. It's not the coronation that Bill Shorten hoped it would be. And just imagine, Tom, if there is a hung parliament, um, what do you think is going to get in between Bill Shorten and his dream of becoming Prime Minister? Absolutely nothing. He will do whatever deal is necessary with the Greens in order to form government, and we could be in those dark days again of the Gillard minority government with extreme climate change policies, like a carbon tax, uh, being adopted. So this is just yet another reminder for voters to think very carefully mm. about the choice they have at this election. We've got the government trying to make climate a pretty big issue. Labor is talking about it being the party that acts on climate change. Would you consider whichever party wins to have a mandate in this area? Well, Tom, we've set forward, I think, a very comprehensive and effective climate change policy that acts on environmental concerns that all Australians have uh, without doing damage to our economy. And I can't see the Liberal Party changing its view on that uh, after the election. I think hopefully we're in government and we continue to implement our policy. But even if we're not, um, mm. I think we, st we would stand by a very good policy. So no mandate for Labor if they have a strong election result. They've had this policy out for quite some time, this 45% reduction target, in fact, I think it's from the last election campaign. Would, would you consider that to be a mandate at all? Well, without getting too much into hypotheticals here, Tom, I would say that um, the Labor Party wouldn't be any, in a strong position to lecture anyone about mandates given their conduct over the last six years in office. Uh, we've won mandates uh, at two successive elections for a range of policies that the Labor Party have fought tooth and nail, uh, the Australian Building Construction Commission uh, being just one of those. In fact, at almost every federal election, the Liberal Party has taken that uh, policy uh, to the people, received mandates for it and has been fought tooth and nail by the Labor Party. So we won't be taking lectures from them on mandates at any time. All right, well, I guess uh, you guys are on a unity ticket now. I accept your point on that, but I suppose both sides will be saying that now uh, off into the future. Uh, the Palmer preference deal that's been done, now, we know why, because of his sudden power. We know why he has that power with voters, because of the, the cash splash. Are you comfortable with a billionaire seemingly buying power in our democracy? Well, Tom, in, in the case of the Liberal Party's preferences, we will finish first or second in almost every single seat that we contest in the House of Representatives around the country, and that means our preferences will never be distributed. In the handful of seats where they are distributed, uh, it will be because the Liberal Party faces the unenviable choice of whether our preferences should go to either the Greens or the Labor Party, and we've chosen the lesser of two evils there, and our preferences will be going to Labor over the Greens. So there's virtually no foreseeable scenario where Liberal preferences would go to Clive Palmer. Um, so in that case, I, I am completely comfortable. What about the Senate? Well, I'm not conceding uh, with two and a half weeks to go uh, that our third Liberal and National candidates uh, in the Senate seat... OK, which but is that's a conceivable chance, isn't it? I understand what you're well, saying I'm, about Well, it, it will be very premature. Seat. We've had two days of uh, early voting, Tom. It will be very premature to concede those spots. Um, mm. I, I think, in all seriousness, and there's been good analysis done on this, Tim Colbatch uh, had one on the Inside Story website uh, yesterday, that the likely thing is that the Liberal and National Party candidate in the third position will be one of the last remaining candidates in each... Uh, seat, Senate seat, and therefore that they'll either be elected themselves or if they're not elected, their preferences won't be distributed either. What about the position of Clive Palmer though, and the potential power? I'm not saying you should concede sure. the spot, but should we have a consideration of capping donations by individuals? I have to say I'm sceptical about those kind of proposals, Tom. Um, I'd be happy to look at them, but I am sceptical about them. Uh, I think it's really up to the good judgment of the Australian people. I mean, I, I certainly don't advocate a vote for Clive Palmer or any other minor party. And I think the main thing for voters to consider when contemplating potentially independent or minor party is when they've voted for those parties in the past, have they actually got what they voted for? In the case of previously voting for Clive Palmer, uh, they didn't in, in the end get Clive Palmer senators. They got a Glenn Lazarus party mm. senator and a Jackie Lambert party senator and Pauline Hanson's One Nation has had very similar experiences. So um, I, I think one thing you know uh, about the major parties at least, I certainly don't encourage people to vote Labor, but at least when you vote for a major party you will get the major party that you vote for.
But what about that whole concept? I mean, should we, be, should we at least be wary of this, given how much Clive Palmer's spending is trumping the major parties? Should this at least be a watching brief for Australia that our democracy is not being bought? Well, voters should absolutely be wary of any political party that spends a lot of money and put forward very few policies or very few details of their policies. And they can be, but I'm uh, talking the... about whether we want to control in terms of how much money can be spent. Well, I think all Australians should have an unlimited right to participate in our democracy. And if they really want to um, spend an inordinate amount of their own money trying to persuade uh, people to vote for them, well, that, that's their choice. I'm not sure it's money well spent. I'm not sure it's a very good return on investment. Um, but if that's what they want to do, it's up to them. Really, the burden falls on all voters to, to be very wary of the promises made and to interrogate the parties that are standing for office, no matter how much money they're spending or whether they're spending their own money or money that's donated to them. All right, we'll take that as a, a no on the, the donations. Uh, possible reform, I guess you could call it. Um, Jeremy Hearn, the Liberal candidate for Allies Axe, now he's been disendorsed after these comments about Muslims. Does it uh, beg the question of why the party couldn't find this out before, or if journalists or perhaps other parties have found these comments online? Well, just firstly, Tom, I have to say I completely repudiate Jeremy Hearn's comments. They don't reflect the views or the values of the Liberal Party or Liberal members at all, and that's why we've taken the decisive action we've taken. The Herald Sun published their story this morning, and by 9am uh, we'd taken action to disendorse him as a candidate to send a very clear signal that it does not reflect our views. Um, had we known uh, that Mr Hearn had the views that he had, he would not have been endorsed. Right. And what about whether the Liberal Party should have found them out? Does it say something about the resources at all? Well, I think it is a challenge for all parties. You know, Labor's had their problems with their um, Northern Territory Senate candidate who believes that Jews are shape-shifting lizards secretly controlling the world. Um, all parties have had their issues with candidates with um, unpublicised extreme views. Um, and it is a real challenge when you're running hundreds of candidates around the country in the age of social media to vet everything, every utterance that they might have made uh, over their lifetime online. Mm. What about, uh, for example, the comments of Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, because you're a big advocate of freedom of speech? Where does this sort of line go? You don't want this person within the Liberal Party, but should he have been able to come here and espouse his views in Australia? Well, I mean, Tom, I've, I've addressed this issue previously. I mean, my, as you say, um, free speech is a really important uh, value to, to me personally, to the Liberal Party, of course. Um, so I err on the side of free speech uh, as much as possible. In the case of Mr Yiannopoulos, though, he, he made um, incredibly extreme remarks um, right after the Christchurch massacre. Uh, and so I think it was reasonable for the government on that occasion to deny him a visa to Australia. And, and you stand by that view now? You haven't been previously advocating for the government to let free speech win? Well, Tom, as I've said, I'm a free speech advocate. You know that. Um, that's an issue that's close to my heart, as I think it is to the hearts of all of my colleagues. Um, but when it comes to people, I think, inciting uh, hatred and inciting violence, I think a very clear, bright line can be drawn, uh, and we should all be mindful of that. Can I ask finally about childcare? Because Labor's pledge on the weekend to essentially subsidise the pay rise for childcare has the government saying, well, why should the government fund this? Is it a bit of a, a separate issue compared to other industries? Because it's clearly a productivity measure and you've also got an affordability measure for parents. So the key question, I suppose, on this is do childcare workers deserve a pay rise, do you think? Well, I want to improve the take-home pay of childcare workers, and I think the best way we can do that, Tom, is to cut their taxes. And that's what we're planning to do. We've set out in the budget a plan to lower taxes for all workers, childcare workers included, so they will be better off under a Liberal government. Um, what the Labor Party is doing here is very unorthodox, and it is precedent-setting. Uh, if they say that they believe that the government should tax some workers in private businesses so that other workers in private businesses can have their wages subsidised, and that those businesses should have their prices regulated to make sure sure uh, that there isn't an increase in cost for consumers, why would you stop only at the childcare industry? As the aged care industry have said, um, they believe that their workers uh, deserve a higher pay. They would like their workers to be paid highly. It's an important uh, uh, job as well. Uh, is the Labor mm. Party really going to be able to resist uh, the urge to spread this uh, on an economy-wide basis? And if they do, right. um, that's a fairly radical thing. That's a fairly extreme uh, turnover in our economy. But on childcare, when you mention taxing some to pay for others, it's already happening under the coalition. This is a hugely subsidised area, so it's already happening. It's a question of to no, what extent. No, that's not it right, happen. Tom. I mean, 
that's not right. We don't directly subsidise the wages of childcare workers. What we do is subsidise the fees that parents pay. And in fact, under our government, uh, childcare fees have fallen by 8.9% in the last year. So we are improving affordability for users of childcare and we want to improve the take home pay of childcare workers. And we think the best and most direct way to do that is to cut their taxes. Um, unlike Mr Shorten, we want lower taxes, not higher taxes. And the $387 billion of higher taxes that he plans to mm. levy if he's Prime Minister will hit childcare workers and all other workers on, on ordinary average incomes. So on, on their wages though in of themselves, I think the average salary is in the order of $22 an hour, except you're saying, well, we'll give them a tax cut at the very lower end. Labor gives them a more generous tax cut, but it's still not a lot. We're talking about a few hundred dollars a year. Do you think they deserve a pay rise outside of the normal cycle or not? Well, Tom, I don't accept for a moment that the Labor Party is offering higher tax cuts. Uh, when our plan is rolled out in full, people on very modest incomes, very average wages, people like bricklayers and carpenters and police and nurses and firefighters will be mm. much better off to the tune of hundreds, if not thousands yeah, of dollars over the a ten year years, uh, under yeah, the coalition. The next That's election, right. But well, 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 Tom, we've, it, okay, legislated, aside, no, Tom okay, we've legislated our full all tax... It, okay, well, it's not all legislated, but look, if we can put that to one side, do you think these workers deserve a pay rise outside of the normal process or is that not affordable? Tom, I, I recently became a, a father for the first time and uh, my wife's currently on maternity leave and is contemplating her return to work soon and when my son ne needs to go into childcare, as he, as he will, um, the first and most important thing I want for him is that he be um, safe and secure and cared for um, well and, uh, and if he can also benefit from some early childhood education while he's there, that would be a, a terrific bonus. So I want childcare workers to be well paid for the important work that they do um, but I think the most direct and tangible way that we can and actually help those workers is by reducing their tax burden, mm. not by an unorthodox and radical intervention into the childcare um, sector that would no doubt have to be replicated in other sectors. It would not be tenable to say that we're only just going to do this for one industry. And indeed, when Bill Shorten <laughs> announced the policy, he said this is the first industry uh, that he's going to intervene in. So um, okay. who knows where it will Fair end. enough. And they were forced to clarify on that one. But you're basically saying the market's working. Well, Tom, I, I, as I said, I, I want to see childcare workers uh, paid better. I think they do really important work. I value the work that they do. The Liberal Party values the work that they do. We spend billions of dollars a year to fund uh, the childcare industry to make it affordable and make it high, ensure that it's high quality. Uh, but the best thing we can do to help childcare workers is to stop taking so much money uh, in their taxes of the money that they do earn. If we let them keep more of what they earn, they will be better off, and that's how we should help them. James Patterson, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Tom.